And the frequency may increase. I'm sure that it will. But we are living in the age of the itching ear preachers. And also the age of the itching ear congregants. For it to work, both have to be present. I want to talk to you today. For there are things that are preached today. Subjects that are taken. Ministries that are growing. That are literally ex exploding and bursting at the seams. That if that preacher would have preached those same things 20 years ago, the ministry wouldn't have lasted a month because the doctrine was not sound. This is the age of the itching ear preacher and the itching ears Congregants, As I have said, it may get worse, and it will. But we're living in the time in which the value or the worthiness of the truth, the preacher, and the church is measured by how it fits in or agrees with Whatever it is that we want to do. If that church's gospel, whether it's true or not, helps you do, help you do what you want, then that is a good church. This explains how the churches that preach the cheap grace are just blowing up. We see the phenomenon now of men in their 50s. Preachers in his 50s, his wife in their 50s and 60s going backwards. Dressing, walking, talking, and adopting the hairstyles of millennials and children. trying to appeal, but it works because the children want to be led by children. See, the kids want someone who, all those who follow that ministry, want the leader to be down on their level. They don't want a leader who will call them to a higher level. Which is the conventional way everything has worked in the world up until now. So the preacher says, I need to look like a child. I need to at 60 look like a millennial. I need to learn their language. I need to behave like them so that I can win them. The question, however, of winning someone from a philosophical standpoint is, have you really won anyone to anything 
if in winning them, they are still the way that they were before they entered into the contest. See, I got one to the Lord at a particular church and I liked that church and I was a, I was a drunk when they won me. And I'm a drunk now. Well, then what have they been won to? God said to the prophet Jeremiah, they shall come up to your standards. You shall not go down to theirs. You don't like my preaching today. I, t I told you that we may not shout, but that we ought to. Self-interest rules the day. If the truth does not, does not line up with our own tastes, then we leave that church or that preacher. And we find one who will tell us what we want to hear. Not necessarily what we need to hear, but necessarily what we want to hear. It is the same as, you've heard this phrase, Doctor shopping. When one goes doctor shopping, one goes from, uh, from doctor to doctor to find one who will write a certain prescription. Sometimes with opiates and painkillers. The doctor won't give you any more because he's afraid that you might get hooked. Well, then that person then goes doctor shopping, and uh, he finds a doctor who will write the prescription. Now never, never mind that it may end up killing him, or he may end up hooked on drugs, but he shopped until he found somebody who would tell him what he wanted to hear, whether he needed to hear it or not. The ugly truth, the hard reality is and preachers, I want you to hear me, that ear ticklers are more often than not some of the most remarkably successful preachers of our time. The ear ticklers, churches grow. The ear ticklers make a, make a whole lot of money. Oh, yes, they do. They have huge followings. They own television and radio. They have even talk shows now. They have CDs and books and series after series. Some even have their own radio channel. Well, now. XM Satellite Radio got, the, got their own channel because they've mastered the art of telling you what you want to hear. <laughs> Rather than telling you the truth. And sometimes they tell you the truth, but they tell you the truth for the wrong reasons. They, they mastered the art of designing messages to communicate what the audience want to hear. They appeal, listen to me, to our primal, primal or primeval nature. Anytime you speak of the primal or prim, primeval nature of something. Primeval is first, original. Primeval, prime, primal is base. So when you're talking about the primal nature of a person, you're talking about their base nature. The base nature of humans is that we are fallen. Where Christianity and secular psychology parts company, one of the major areas that they part company is that the secular psychologists teach that man at his core is basically good. So that if you could just look within yourself, trust your heart, you'll find everything you need on the inside because basically 
you're good. Christianity, on the other hand, teaches that man at his core was basically good until the fall. The Bible tells us that God looked at the human race, looked at his, his creation, and he called it good. Very good. But when man failed, Jesus looked at people and said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Ghost to them that ask? Man on his, at his primal level is not good. The human race needed a savior. If we, did, if we were basically good, then, then there would have been no need for Jesus to come. We could have from within ourselves saved ourselves. That's why we are the world. We are the children. We are the ones to build a better world. Uh, didn't work. As the charge we're making, notice what the song says. We're saving our own life. Just you and me. Uh-uh, no, no, no. Anything that leaves God out. Anything that leaves Jesus out is doomed to failure. Because at our core, we are evil. And it is manifested at our core on a primal level. That part that the ear ticklers appeal to. Are you following? Notice this. The ear ticklers know how to appeal to our primal level because at a prime level for us more is always appealing. Everybody wants more. Whether you need more of a thing or not, everybody wants more. We are not happy today. If you want the folk to come back for the Sunday night service, you can't promise them 34. You can't promise them 64. The only thing that get folk to come back out now, you got to promise a hundredfold blessing. Because 30 is not enough. 60 is not enough. We've got to have a hundredfold. Oh my, think about it, think about it. Oh, we, you know, uh, that was a time when a blessing would be sufficient. That time is gone. Now you have to promise people a miracle. And, uh, and I got something to tell you about that miracle stuff in just a minute, see. And then, you know, the word miracle, because it's way over you. It's you, it's losing its luster. So now, to get folk excited, we can't say God's going to give you a miracle. It's got to be a ridiculous miracle. We got to add, we got to add another adjective to that. Or we're not interested. The, the, the problem is, at our core, we're not satisfiable. Why do you think the going to the next level was so appealing? I mean, every sermon, man, next level, next level. Next. Now, you know it wasn't God. I mean, how many levels have you got? How did it work out for you? Next level, next. And you know why next level seemed to be so appealing and we liked it? Because in our mind, next literally meant more or better. Next meant elevation. We're not prepared when next level means uh, in order to get to where God wants you to go, you got to go through a time of suffering. Say, well, what in the world is going on with me, Pastor? Well, you, you've gone to the next level. 
Well, this don't seem like the next level to me, but that's the way life is. It, it's, life has its ups and downs, but even the downs are up if you're in the will of God. But that doesn't jive with our primal level. You, we don't suffer well. The arrogance of us. Why did my pastor have to die? Why did my mama have to die? Why did my daddy have to die? What, would you rather it was someone else's? Everybody's going to eventually go through. Why is it I have to go through this? Well, would you, would you want, want to be someone else? At our primal level, yes. That's what we're saying. Yes, Lord, yes. I want it to be someone else. I don't ever want it to be me. That's base nature. That's the selfishness of man. Oh, my. This is good preaching. At our primal level, even God. God matters as long as he can give to us. Heal us. A supernatural blessing for us. A miracle for us. But it has to be for us. All preachers know if you preach a sermon about uh, in turn that, that deal with calling people to do something for him, you ain't going to get paid. And they won't hardly say amen. Because we don't, we don't want to hear uh, a message that calls us to duty. Or calls us to suffer. Or challenges us to sacrifice. Or challenges us to push through our own selfish ambition. Causes us to lay aside some of the things that we want to do for the greater good of the kingdom. Messages like that don't fly. And they certainly don't sell. You know why? They do not appeal to our base nature. If I would ask you today, how many or who wants a miracle? Everybody in here would raise their hand. Whether you need a miracle or not. I'm going to tell, tell you right there, right now. The overwhelming majority of people in here today and the overwhelming majority, I said overwhelming majority. I didn't say everybody, so please don't say, well, some people may. I said overwhelming majority. I said majority. All right? Let me, before I go any further, I said majority. As a matter of fact, I said overwhelming majority. Is that what I said? The overwhelming majority of listeners who will hear this on our YouTube channel, who are, who are streaming live now, who are here in the sanctuary, who will, however you hear this message, you will not get a miracle. For good reason. God has been so good to you that you don't need one. Have you seen the condition that people were in to whom Jesus gave miracles? Blind, maimed, halt, right. crippled, dead. Right. And look at you, you're sitting there, good God almighty, health in your body. <laughs> sitting there and your hands can clap and your eyes can see. You got legs to walk and a tongue to talk. You ought to, you know what we ought to have? We ought to have a thank God that I don't need a miracle service because the Lord has been watching over me and he's kept me down through the years. Thank you that I don't have high blood pressure. Thank you that I don't have diabetes. Thank you, Lord, that you kept me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Wow, oh, thank you. You ought to be glad. Hallelujah. You don't need, God don't, you look at, look how blessed you are. The Lord don't need two fish 
and five barley loaves to feed you today because he filled up your refrigerator. <laughs> Food all in there, all in there. You got the refrigerator for it and then the freezer in the other room. Half of you begin to cook Sunday dinner last night. All you got to do is go home and warm the stuff up. God's been good to you. And you're sitting there talking about, I ain't got no miracle. You don't need a miracle. And that's a good reason to praise the Lord. Now, if you want to volunteer for one, Keep living. And yet it's good that when you can be on your way to work, somebody pull out in front of you. You hit that car and bounce off that car, then hit a telegram pole. And God not let the pole split and fall on you and take your life. And then, see, when you needed a miracle, then the Lord, the Lord sent an angel. The Lord pfft, said, don't, don't, don't let them kill Beth. Take care of Beth. Satan, you can't have her. It ain't her time yet. Now, when you needed one, when you needed the Lord, he stepped in on time. You ought to praise him for him stepping in, but you ought to praise him because he kept you and you went to work without incident. Why is it that we can't praise him for getting from point A to point B without incident? Why something got to happen before we can praise the Lord? We ought to thank him because he kept me. And I thank you because you never left me. Everybody in here ought to be praising the Lord. Well, I don't have any joy because my loved one is sick. Well, how you doing? Well, I'm fine. But my loved one is sick. Well, how you doing? I'm fine. But my loved one is sick. Well, how you doing? I'm fine. But my loved one is sick, and I can't praise the Lord at all because my loved one is sick. Well, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. So they hadn't got it yet. I think you ought to feel bad because your loved one is sick. But your hand ought to go up because both of you could be. But if God has spared your life and the Lord has been good to you, you still ought to give him a praise. And the next time you're in a service and somebody said, who wants a miracle? And if you're sitting there and you know as far as you know you don't need one, you ought to get happy just because you don't need one. And then pray for those who do that the Lord will provide. And uh, if you notice, I don't, if you notice this, I don't preach with that uh, neighbor. It, I call it the lost your mind mantra. You, you, I could, you could have, yeah, you know, it, it works because, you know, people, it, it appeals to the base of nature of man. You know, people aren't thinkers. People are feelers. So everybody like to feel like their trial is the worst ones. Everybody in here, I've gone through some things that were so bad that I could have lost my mind. No, 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 I'm not that weak. I've been through the storm. I've been through the rain. I've been lied on, criticized, and rebuked and scorn, but I serve a God who's a keeper. Now I wasn't about to lose my mind. Yes, I've been afraid. Yes, I've been shaken. But I thank God that he's given me the love, power, and a sound mind. Now that's what I want you to tell your neighbor. Shake your neighbor's hand and tell them, I'm not losing my mind. Amen. Life don't make me crazy. I'm not going to be that weak. Life happens. Oh, I, you don't like my preaching, do you? Life happens. Everybody got to live. He was 42. No, he was 46. You were 42. 43 with little children. 
the great elder James Henry Turner died. Some dark days, some tough times. But Mother Turner, you didn't lose your mind. You, hey, you had to think. You had to rely on the Lord. You had to rely on your wits. Oh, do you, can, can you imagine what would have happened to you and your children had you actually lost your mind? Yeah. Losing your mind wasn't an option. So, and, and you know what? Most of us have been through situations where we understood that losing our minds is not an option. So the next time you're in a service, don't let nobody make you weak. Neighbor, neighbor, I could have lost my mind. No, turn my hand loose. No, I didn't lose my mind. God touched my mind and he anointed me to think. He anointed me to reason. Good God Almighty, he made me strong. Somebody shout and praise God for a strong mind. Now you know, some of you, some of you in the audience and on the platform don't know how to take that kind of preaching. I see you looking, I see you looking off. But I'm right. And, and you know what you ought to be doing? You ought to be grabbing hold to it before you lose your mind. Don't, don't play with losing your mind. People who lose their minds don't find their minds. You lose your mind, you won't get your mind back. And when Jesus get through with you, nobody who had Jesus lost their mind. When Jesus get through with you, you are found clothed, sitting, and in your right mind. Somebody shout something in here. Oh no. You're not, you're not gonna put me in that group. I don't. You know what? I'm, I'm gonna let you know something. I've never said it. Just that's right. Tell you never. Tell three of them. Tell 40. Go tell a hundred people. High five, 600 of them. I could I could have lost my mind. And, and, and neighbor. If, you, if you'd have been gone through what I've gone through. See, that all that stuff appeals to the base nature of people. Now, y'all don't mess with my mic now. The base nature of people to make you think that your suffering is worse than everyone else's. So you want a trophy. See, you got to know they're gaming you. They're gaming you. Because most of the stuff that we call today trials. Our forefathers call life. Thank you for watching God First with Bishop Patrick L. Wooden Sr. and the Upper Room Church of God in Christ. To experience this message in its entirety, call 877-463-3477 to purchase a DVD or CD. God First will return next week at the same time. Until then, make every day a God first day.